Christmas. Merry Christmas. Isn't it great, though? The rest of the world can have a Merry Christmas. You know, it's sort of like, happy? We have a joy-filled Christmas. We are ecstatic, and we are joy-filled, not just because of the birth of the Savior, but because we know that he was born to die for our sins, raised on our behalf, ascended into glory, coming again. This is our Savior, Jesus. We're having like a super-duper extra, extra happy, ecstatic, okay, Merry Christmas. So, so next time somebody says Merry Christmas to you, just sort of smile, but you know on the inside. That's not a big enough word uh, for what's going on here. Let's turn to um, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, we're finishing off this paragraph of Scripture, verses thir- uh, 3 through 14. We've been dealing with it for about two months now, working our way slowly through it, trying to uh, get a sense of the rich uh, flavor of what Paul is talking about. The, the reason why we bless God is because he has blessed us, and then the, the verses 3 through 14 is telling us um, what that blessing is. And it starts out with God the Father and what he has done, God the Son, what he has done. This morning we look at the Holy Spirit and what he has done, having spent a couple of weeks uh, thinking about who the Holy Spirit is uh, just in the last two weeks or so. Um, I, what, what I want you to see, though, is that this, this is sort of like the whole work of God in, in salvation. Um, if, you, if you've been with us all these eight, nine weeks or whatever it's been, um, j- just think about it. He starts off and he says, the Father chose us before the foundation of the world. It's, it, it's, it's not chronological, but it's almost sequential. That Before creation starts, before history starts, before the human race starts, before anything else, God within himself, out of grace and love and mercy, chose us. This is what the Father has done. And not only that, he predestined us to be adopted as his children, to be brought into his family. This is something that happened before the world ever began. And then uh, Paul talks about what Christ has done for us, that the Son came to bring us redemption by dying on the cross, bearing our sins, taking them upon his shoulders so that we might be forgiven. And so the Son has redeemed us, being redeemed, and having the forgiveness of sins, that the burden of sins is taken away. This is something that happened in history. A historian, if he is honest about it, will tell you Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's it's just a fact of history. Happened within the realm of of, of human endeavor and and what goes on in our lives. So uh, this is something that happened in history, that Christ the Son came, died for our sins, that we might have redemption and forgiveness. Of course, uh, born along with that is that he was raised from the dead and ascended in his coming in. And all these are, are, are things that God has done in history for us through the Son. This morning then, a little bit later on, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit who works in us personally, that he has brought us to hear the gospel and respond with faith, and that he has worked in our lives. So if you, if you look at these verses, you sort of see the sequence. God before the foundation of the world, choosing us, electing us, and that the Son in history, died for our sins, and then in our own private history, if you will, in our own lives, the Holy Spirit working to bring us um, into a knowledge and a faith in Jesus Christ. So that's sort of what's been going on here. Now, in verses 13 and 14, he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we took a little bit of time the last two weeks to, uh, to understand what the promise of the Holy Spirit is, that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit that uh, the Holy Spirit was promised through the prophets, uh, particularly the prophet Joel, and that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And the first sermon in the church was about what happens when you receive Christ, that the Father sends the gift of the Holy Spirit into the heart of the believer. When you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit. So uh, the Holy Spirit was promised, and that promised Holy Spirit comes to us. That's what we've been talking about the last two weeks. Uh, This morning, we finish off this paragraph Uh, of Scripture, looking at verses 13 and 14. Now, what I would like to do is read all of verses 3 through 14. And as we're reading, just sort of be sensitive to how Paul is describing the work of the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how Paul is describing uh, that work on our behalf. That's the blessing with which God has blessed us. That's why we bless God, all right? So let's look at verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious Father, we do pause to give you thanksgiving and praise for the gift of your Son, Jesus, to us. As we celebrate his advent, we also celebrate that you have brought to us in him a joy that is unbounded and a confidence and a boldness that is strong and secure. Father, we're thankful that you have given to us the gift of knowing you through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, that when this baby came to earth, he came to experience the fullness of of, of humanity, to experience everything we experience and yet without sin that he came to die in our place, to be raised on our behalf, and, Father, that he's coming again. Father, we thank you for the meaning of Christmas, which is your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would make us ever bold and ever confident in sharing that good news of what Christmas means, that others would also come to him to offer him their lives and to worship him. Father, we ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. You know, when I was a kid, or should, should I say that, when I was a boy? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we did Christmas better. I think so. Every generation says that, but I, I, you know, I'm to the age now where I get to say it. We did Christmas better. I mean, there, there are decorations all over downtown because the government could still put them up. And there were little crush scenes and Christmas scenes all over the parks and the schools because you could still do that kind of thing. So I, I think we've lost a little bit in that regard, but, but it, it's still a good time. It's still a fun time. Um, I know that when, when uh, I was younger, I always heard people decrying the um, commercialism of Christmas. Oh, this is a terrible thing. All we're interested in is buying gifts and, and buying a... Uh, uh, presents for people, and it's all about money, money, and buying, 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 and, and uh, being a, a good child, I thought, well, I, I should be, you know, at the age of eight, I should be a curmudgeon about Christmas. Oh, you people don't know what Christmas is all about. You know, it's not about buying gifts and all that. And then I decided, at least people are being nice. You know, at least they're pretending, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, a little more pretending couldn't hurt. So um, I, I decided, well, you know, just let it go, and let's just have fun with it. And so it's, it's a joyous season. It's a really good time of the year. And that's why if you're going through a struggle and if something's painful right now during the Christmas season, sometimes it hurts twice as bad. Because you see other people, and they're rejoicing, and they're happy, and they're going to see family, and and all you know is that uh, you're struggling, maybe with an illness, maybe with a brokenness in the family, maybe it's with a, a, a depression or, a, or something going on inside of you. You know, whatever it is, when everybody else is happy, it hurts a little bit more um, to be unhappy. And, uh, you know, one of the things that happens to us is we get unsure of ourselves. We get a little bit insecure about, about things because... It looks like everybody else is coping just fine. Of course, we don't know what's going on in their lives. Um, But uh, to us, it looks like they're doing fine. To them, it looks like we're doing fine. Uh, But we we get this idea that maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe there's something that I'm not getting. And so we 
we have kind of uh, an, an insecurity and maybe a self-doubt uh, going on. Uh, you know, I know a lot about self-doubt the older I get. Um, you do too. I can prove it to you. Did you put the garage door down? <laughs> Did you? Hmm? Are you sure? See, when I left this morning, I made sure I put it down because I knew I was going to do this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm like feeling really good about myself. But okay, I mean, be honest. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever turned around to go back to see if the door was closed? I mean, you, you know this is true. But, uh, you know, uh, just, just a small metaphor for the way we go through life. We think we know what we're doing, then we're not sure we know what we're doing, and we become really unsure of ourselves, and we're filled with kind of self-doubt. Uh, but the really debilitating part of, of being insecure about, about what's going on is when we got, start to get insecure about our salvation and insecure about our relationship with God. Um, we know that we're church members and we know that we're good Christian people, but, but we see other folks and it seems like they're doing so much I don't know what this means, but better than we are. Maybe they're, they're, it seems like their prayer life is stronger. Maybe it seems like their faith is, is more operative. Maybe it seems like uh, uh, they're just doing naturally the things that we struggle to do in the faith. Um, maybe it's because we're keeping score and we're on the losing tab of it. You know, we get this idea that faith is a, is a quantity thing and that uh, if you have more faith, God loves you more. If you have more faith, God does more for you. We don't see a lot happening or maybe we're, we're, we're going through a tough stretch and we're thinking maybe I'm failing on this faith thing. So we have these, these doubts and these wonderments and, and even to the point sometimes we wonder about our salvation. You know, I'll have people come up to me and they'll say things like, Pastor, do you ever have doubts and questions? And I tell them, that's where I live. I live in doubts and questions. The great thing is, though, when you study something you have a question about or you just yield something to God, you have a doubt about it and you wonder about it, what I can tell you, ultimately, God will give you an answer. It might take years uh, some of the things I've been thinking about for a very long time, and, and uh, it can take decades, but oh, the joy when God opens up a scripture or opens up a thought pattern, and you see, oh, so that's what God is about, and that's, that's what's going on here. So a lot of the things that you may have questions about and doubts about, all I can say is, you know, if you'll just be faithful and hang in there, God will open the door and he'll show you the answers. And if you don't get it this side of heaven, you sure will in heaven because there we'll just be before the throne and we'll say, you know, God does everything perfectly well and, and this is perfect. And, and we say, oh, you know, that doubt, that confusion I had, I see where it works now. You know, so the answers are coming. But we have doubts and we have wonderments, which is why I think these next two verses in Ephesians chapter 1 are going to be so very important to us. Just in verses 13 and 14, we have this this. A really strong indication of why we can have confidence in the grace of God and we can have confidence in our salvation, why we can have assurance and security in our faith. I want for us to look at verses 13 and 14 with just that in mind. Now, again, the reason uh, 13 and 14 might be really good for that is that it talks about the very point where we have the weakness and the doubt. See, when we were talking about God the Father, we said, well, God the Father chose us before the foundation of the world and predestined us for adoption. That's what God does. God's going to get it right. Everything's going to be, be exactly the way God designs it, and that's what God is doing. And then we read about how Jesus died for our sins to redeem us, to forgive us of our sins. That's something Jesus did. We know that he's going to do that perfectly. But in a moment, we're going to read that uh, as we get into verses 13 and 14, that we heard the gospel and we believed. And that's where we have the doubt. We start to doubt, well, maybe this is my part of the equation and I'm just not doing what I ought to do. I'm, I'm not measuring up to where I ought to be on the faith scale. We get the idea that, that maybe God saves us on a point system. Come on, we do. That, oh, I, ha I have a little bit of faith, but somebody else over there, they, they have a little bit more faith than I do. And, and that's maybe they, they read their Bible more. Maybe they're really good at scripture memorization. Or, or maybe they, 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 they're just more excited about the faith. And then there's somebody else who has even more faith because, after all, they seem to understand the mysteries of the faith a little better than I do. They have a little more conversation. And here's somebody who has really wonderful faith because miraculous things seem to always be happening. And, and, and here's somebody else, and they, they must have a monster score of faith, sort of like your SATs. 
We wouldn't call it a faith aptitude test, would we? Okay, let that settle. It's coming in on you now. Okay, but anyway, well, you know, but you know, if if we could just have a score, if you didn't get asked later, but then you know, we, you know, we, if our faith just scores high enough, then we're gonna be sure about our salvation. But I'm just living over here where there's where I have no faith at all, and and I'd compare to that, I'm not doing. It. So we start to doubt ourselves and doubt our faith. One of the glorious things about the gospel is uh, a fellow named Jesus. He said, guys, if you want to understand what faith is, and he turned to his child and he said, kid, come here. Come here, kid. And of course, being a preschooler, he wouldn't come. <laughs> his mother had to push him. But anyway, he says, kid, come on over here. And, and he gets him there and says, guys, if you want to understand what the kingdom of God is all about, right here, this child, you've got to become like a little child when you believe. And one of the great privileges of my life is to stand at the front of the church when a child comes forward. And they always say something like, I asked Jesus into my heart and I want to be baptized. And immediately I say, that's nice. What do you know about the hypostatic union of the two natures of Christ? <laughs> <laughs> no, just inside you're doing cartwheels. <laughs> you know, here's a child who believes and with the faith of a child and God says, I honor that faith. Because you've got to come like a child, just, just believing, you know. And whatever questions there are, out there, we'll figure that out later. I'm in the moment of believing in Jesus and asking him into my heart. I want to be baptized. I want to tell the world that I believe in Jesus. And that's all it takes. I mean, didn't Jesus at one time say that faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains? And so it's not the quantity of faith. It's not like you have to have a big score of faith. But that's why we doubt it, because we, we see that, that that's, that's part of our equation, you know, that, that, that maybe we're not believing hard enough or strong enough or the right way or whatever it is. Um, but I'll, I want for us to read these verses together so that we'll have confidence, boldness, and assurance of our salvation in Christ. All right, so let's read that together. We'll start at verse 13. He says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the first reason you can be confident of, of your salvation is because you heard the word of truth. See, a lot of people hear the gospel, but they don't listen to the gospel. Can I make it that way? I don't know. There might even be a few folks in the room today. Now, as we're talking about Christ and we're talking about God's grace and, and, and the love of God in Christ Jesus, ours by the power of the Holy Spirit, and what are we doing? We're on the iPhone and we're texting somebody or we're coloring in the dots on the, on the bulletin or what I used to do. I used to add up the numbers on the tote board, try to figure out which ones were prime numbers. I was a nerd. I mean, it was terrible. But, you know, but a lot of times that gospel presentation is being made and goes, it goes right by us because we're not listening. But one day we hear the gospel story and we say, you know, it's not just Jesus was a baby born in the manger. He, he did a lot of things and told nice stories. It's Jesus Christ was born in order to die for my sins, in order that I might know the Father through the Son. We may not phrase it that way, but someday, one day, that gospel came alive to us and we truly heard the message. We heard the gospel of our salvation and we heard it as if for the first time. You know, I, I, you've heard people say things like, I grew up in church and nobody ever told me about Jesus. Maybe you weren't listening. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a church somewhere that doesn't talk about Jesus. I don't know, but there, there's a lot of folks. You can go through church your whole life, and you never hear because your ears are never open. But if your ears were open, if one day you heard the old, old story, and your heart just burned within you, and you knew you had to have this Jesus, if you heard the gospel story, and you realized this is for me, you see, the... The, the historian will tell you Jesus died on a cross. The theologian will tell you Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. But the child of God says, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And when that comes alive in your heart, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It finally, you know, dawns on you. Let me see if I can illustrate that. Keep your finger in Ephesians. I want to read for you something out of the Gospel of John. This is in uh, the first chapter of John. It, we'll start reading verse 29. It has to do with John the Baptist 
Um, and what you need to remember is that John the Baptist was related in some way to Jesus. We're not sure exactly. Usually we talk about them being cousins or Mary and Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth was uh, the mother of John the Baptist, Mary the mother of Jesus. They, we know that they were kinsmen of some kind. They were related in some way. So Jesus and John the Baptist had some kind of familial uh, relationship, and there's a, a good possibility. I mean, there's nothing written down about it, but you think about it, there's probably a possibility that John and Jesus maybe grew up a little bit together, at least got together over, uh, over holidays and for family reunions and things. So John the Baptist knew Jesus, probably knew Jesus. Keep that in mind. Verse 29, Gospel of John, chapter 1, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what I want you to know is that everybody was listening to John the Baptist, and only a few people got it. Most of them say, isn't that interesting, John, where are we going next? Most of them said, well, there's John. You know, that's a great sermon. John was for lunch. But a couple of them at least, Andrew was one of them, got up and said, we've got to find out where this guy's going. We've got to follow this guy. Not everybody got it. And so John's, there's, there's the gospel, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Most people wrote it off, bypassed it, processed it, moved on. Only a few got it and really heard what was being said. But, but we read on. He says, this is the Lamb of God. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. I myself did not know him. John the Baptist says he did not know Jesus. He knew Jesus of Nazareth. He, he, he had to know who this guy was. He knew his name, probably knew his address, you know, those kinds of things. But he says, I didn't really know him. I did not know him, but for this purpose I can baptize him with water that he might be revealed to Israel. John bore witness. He says this. I saw the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. John says, I saw the Holy Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. What made the difference? The Holy Spirit of God. What made the difference was the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit of God revealed to John in, in, in some mechanism that, that we can't nail down and pin down with our, our, our small minds. But John says, I didn't know him until the Holy Spirit told me who he was. See, that's what happens when you come to know Jesus. You don't know him. You never will know him until the Holy Spirit shows him to you and opens your eyes and suddenly you see him and you fall in love with him and you want to be with him and walk with him and so paul says in christ in christ we're back to uh, ephesians chapter one he says in christ you heard the word of truth you finally heard it with understanding this gospel of your salvation you heard it see one of the indications that that you know Jesus and love Jesus as you love the story of Jesus. You love to hear the old, old story because those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. There is no other story but the story of Jesus. Folks, if, if you ever find yourself in a church and you're wondering, when's he going to get to Jesus, you may be in the wrong church. I mean, it, it, Jesus is the only one we have to preach, the only message we have uh, we, we could go on, but one of the, one of the indications that, that you know, that, that you can know you're saved is when you delight in hearing the Word of God, when you delight in hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. If someone comes up to you and says, you know what heaven is, don't you? It's not a big party, a tailgate party in the parking lot. Heaven is all about worshiping Jesus for all eternity. And if your heart says, great, wonderful, Amen and hallelujah. That's the work of the Holy Spirit awakening in you that love for Jesus. Okay? So Paul says, first of all, you've got to understand, you heard, you finally heard the message, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We, we um, uh, move on from that. Heard the word of truth, gospel of salvation, and 
and you believed in him. You had faith in Jesus. Faith is when you invest yourself in who Jesus is. When you say, I, I stake my life on Jesus. I stake my life on following him. I stake my life of living in him according to his will for me. I put my faith in Jesus. Folks, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, well, I, I won't turn to it, but um, you remember that in Romans chapter 8 when we were there, Paul says, you know what happens? We're not saved and we don't live according to the flesh. Y'all remember this? Just, just nod yes, because I'm going to pretend you do. But he said, not by the flesh. The flesh, uh, when, when, when Paul talks about the flesh, it's not just uh, uh, skin, the bones, the sinews, the muscles, and other tissues. Um, but, you know, when, he, when he's talking about the flesh, he's talking about everything that you are without the Spirit. Everything that you are without God. He says, we don't live according to flesh. We don't live according to the limitations of the flesh. We don't live according to the limitations of, of mere humanistic thinking, but rather we live by the Spirit of God. We live by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, he says, because of that, God has sent his Spirit into our hearts. Some of you are ahead of me right now. You're already doing handsprings, aren't you? Because the Holy Spirit gets inside of us, and what does he do? He calls us to well up with us. And what do we cry out? Abba! Father, we call out to God as Father. This is something only Jesus can bring to us. I love of the Father. Oh, I know there's a lot of a popular culture wants to talk about, you know, God loves everybody. Well, okay. Um, it, but he loves his children in a way that's so peculiar. All right. And a lot of people say, God is Father of everybody, but Christians know he is God the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for my sins. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I am brought into a, uh, the throne room of God, and I look at the creator, the sustainer of all the universe, the sovereign God, and I cry out, Abba, my Father in heaven. You see, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, so believing um, is, is a matter of, of being moved by the Holy Spirit to, to cry out to God as Father. That's something only the Holy Spirit does. You know, it, 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 and sometimes it, 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 we'll, we'll say things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about my salvation because I know I've disappointed God. I know I've failed. I know I've stumbled. I've known I've, I know I've sinned. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit is not in your heart, you won't care. But if your heart is broken and shattered because of sin in your life, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of an odd thing, but the people who say, I wonder about my salvation, I doubt my salvation, are the very people who are probably the most secure <laughs> or ought to be the most secure because my experience is only people who really love God, really love Jesus, are really concerned about the issue. People who live for the devil, they don't care. All right, so Paul says, you, you were um, uh, brought to the point where you heard the message, you're brought to the point where you believe the message, and then he says, you were, uh, you heard the word of truth, you believed in him, and at that point, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We already talked about what the promised Holy Spirit was. That's why we spent two weeks on that, so when we got here, you would know what, what we're talking about. We're not just talking about some um, extra add-on to the Christian faith. We're talking about the essence of the Christian faith. You know, you don't believe without the Holy Spirit, and you don't believe in Christ without the Holy Spirit being given to you, those, those kinds of things. Um, but we receive the Holy Spirit. But we are sealed by and in and with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, um, a, a seal, it, you, you, you probably know this, but, you know, just get it in our head. A, a seal is something you use to show uh, that, that something belongs to a certain person, that, uh, you, you know, most of the time we think about a wax, sealing wax, and you put wax on, and then you put a little ring signet in that, right? It has nothing to do with this. <laughs> I just tell you that it was uh, that that came into being like in the 15th century, or, you know, somewhere along there. Um, Google it; you'll find out the, the facts on it. But uh, but back in the days of the New Testament, when Paul was writing, the seal was the emblem. You were talking about the emblem of the person or the government. If you want to see the seal of the United States of America, look at the back of a one-dollar bill. There you will see. You ready for this? The obverse and the reverse. <laughs> Okay, you'll see the front and the back of, of, of the seal of the United States of America. And the issue isn't that somebody had a stamp and they're stamping every dollar bill. The point is that that emblem, that symbolism 
is there. And it says this has to do with the government of the United States. Um, in Rome and in Greece, uh, seals were, were normally just carved into soft stone or they were car carved into wood or they, they were impressed into clay. But the point wasn't the material into which it was impressed. The point was uh, the, the seal that was there. You looked at that and you said, ah, I know whom I'm dealing with at this point. Um, you, you, same kind of thing, uh, the uh, um, uh, notary republic. <laughs> notary Republican. Uh, but, you know, a notary uh, seals the document with their, with their seal, and that says, I'm, I'm, I'm stamping this, I'm authenticating this. By the way, all they're saying is that this is a signature of somebody who identified themselves. Uh, you can still be lying through your teeth, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that. I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. But, the, you know, but a, seal, a seal was used you know, to show ownership. To whom did this thing belong? Um, you know, if, if a contract was sealed up, uh, to whom did this contract belong? Who had the authority over this contract in order to break the seal and execute the contract or a, or a will or a testament, you know, that kind of thing. That's what a seal was uh, for uh, in that regard. It showed ownership. A seal was something that showed authenticity uh, by putting the seal on something, the government says, we, we authenticate this item. We, we say, yeah, yeah, you can count on this. A seal shows a protection. It's oftentimes used to say, don't, don't mess with this thing. And so for ownership and for authenticity and for protection, uh, we are sealed. I remind you that in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, it says that the wrath of God is withheld long enough for the angel to seal the people of God so that they escape the wrath of God. They are sealed and marked out as belonging to God so they'll be protected by God. So Paul says, when you believed, when you heard the gospel and you believed, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to you, and the Holy Spirit in your life is the seal of authentication and ownership and protection by God himself. Now look, who has the right to break a seal of God? Let's just pause for a moment and list all the people. Yeah, that's about right. That's about it. You can't break the seal of God. We are sealed by and with the Holy Spirit. And then Paul goes on to say, not only were you sealed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee? He's the guarantee of our inheritance. It's almost like we have the seal, housekeeping seal of approval or something like that. I don't know. But he, he, th this is the guarantee of our inheritance. We spent some time, you remember, talking about the inheritance. Let me just real quickly remind you, the inheritance is what was given to the children of Israel. When they came into the promised land, each tribe got a piece of land, and that land was called their inheritance or their portion. But the tribe of Levi did not receive an inheritance, a piece of land or a portion. What they received was the priesthood. Their inheritance was to worship God and to serve and to minister before him. And so our inheritance now, our portion is to worship and to glorify God. That's what we talked about a little while ago. And so this Holy Spirit is given as the guarantee of our inheritance, the guarantee that we will worship and praise and serve God for all eternity. That's what the Holy Spirit will lead us to do. This word uh, for, for guarantee uh, sometimes it's translated as earnest. You know, if, you, if you go to buy a piece of property or a house, you might be asked to put down earnest money. And uh, it, can be, it doesn't really matter how much it is. It just depends on the sensitivities of the parties involved. But the earnest money seals the deal. The earnest money says, all right, what we've talked about, it's going to happen. This, this, this contract is going to take place. And the law without that, the, 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 there's a penalty involved. But with God, he seals us with the Holy Spirit and guarantees us a place in our inheritance to serve and to worship him for all eternity. And that, that earnest cannot be taken away. I didn't know this. I was reading about this, naturally. And uh, uh, I found out that in, in Greece today, it, when a guy gives a woman an engagement ring, it's called an arabon. The word here is arabon. It's almost like God gave us the engagement ring. The wedding's on. It's going to happen. You know, 
Christ is coming for his bride. Now, that's not really in there, but boy, it was fun thinking about it, wasn't it? So, uh, you know, he is the, the guarantee. He is the reason that we know what God has promised is going to happen. Now, this is all the work of the Holy Spirit. To hear the gospel, the work of the Holy Spirit. To believe in him is the work of the Holy Spirit. To be sealed and protected as belonging to God is the work of the Holy Spirit. To be guaranteed a place of service and work and ministry, our inheritance to glorify God for all eternity, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, if you ever have, have those, those moments where you're saying, you know, I'm not sure about where I stand in my faith, I'm not sure where I stand in my salvation, understand that the work of the Holy Spirit guarantees our salvation for all eternity. See, our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in our own strength. It's not in our own faith. Our hope is in God the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a pretty good hope. That is a pretty good hope. And so Paul comes to the end of this, this display of all the blessings God has given to us, the Father has given to us, um, you know, from before the foundation of the world through the cross and the resurrection of Christ into, into our, our own experience. And it's all been the work of God all along the way, all along the way. And that's why... Three times, he says, this is to the praise of God's glory. This is to the praise of the glory of God's grace. This is to the praise of his glory, the praise of his glory. This is what God means for us to do, to be giving him glory and honor and, and, and just worshiping him because of this wonderful promise that is ours, the blessings of, of salvation that, is, that has come to us. And, um, okay, that's why one of our core values is this church exists for the praise of the glory of God's grace in Christ Jesus. This is why you know that your purpose as a believer in Jesus Christ is to give God glory, honor, and praise. This is why you know wherever you are, whatever is going on, the best thing you can do is to live for the glory of God. This is why you know that for this coming week, and here's the challenge, you're going to spend every day of it giving God the glory. And you might have the doubt and the question, you said, God, I have a question, but glory to the Father through the Son that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you've got the answer. You know, I might stumble and say, but glory to you, God, that as I come before you convicted and confessing, your Holy Spirit picks me up and gets me going where I should go again. You might have the doubts, you might have the confusion, but whatever it is, give God the glory because that's what he has designed us to do and that's what he has brought us to um, in our lives. Blessed be God the Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, who has called us and chosen us and redeemed us, sealed us, protected us, saved us, all these things, glory to God, absolute glory to God. Okay. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we're just thankful that every time we think of our lives, we see there your goodness calling us from where we have been to where we need to be. Thankful, Father, that when we see before us our sin, you put before us the vision of the righteousness of Christ that is given to us by faith. Father, thankful that when we experience weakness, we know your power, and when we experience confusion and doubt, we know your wisdom. Father, we're just so thankful that you are all and in all. Just use us this week. Use us constantly to be vessels of your praise for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.